Um, moving on the agenda, then we've got, excuse me a second, <coughs> break your right place, then we've got Stephanie Mortum in the room, and we've got Viv online. Uh, can I thank Viv? Because I understand she's on annual leave, so thank you for taking the time to come and join us. And we also have somebody else, but unfortunately, Matt, hi. Gary Sheehan. Gary Sheehan as well. Okay. Um, <coughs> So we issued a direction back in September 23 as part of the Right Care, Right Place, Bed Based, Intermediate Care Programme, succinct titles are always good, aren't they? Right. To work with communities for the future and suspended inpatient services in the Cottage Hospital. So uh, over to yourself, Steph, Viv and Gary. Thank you, um, everybody. And um, um, that's a very brief introduction and the overview just at the paper. Um, outlined in the paper. Therefore, then we're going to talk a wee bit about to give the issues about the engagement process that's taken place since December 2020, and then Gary will explain a wee bit better in terms of the options that have been outlined, and then Vic will take you through the options and phase of process um, and outline um, the timeline uh, round about that. So just um, following on from the directions that were given in September, um, one of the main directions for us was to look at a flexible bed model um, for, our, for our communities. So this paper focuses on the sort of next steps for that. So the paper is outlining the options and the appraisal process. And these options that are presented today have been developed um, in partnership with our communities and our staff. Um, through a robust engagement process that takes place from, um, in particular, uh, December to February. However, there has been extensive engagement before that. It's also been um, information and things that have been useful in that. These have then been developed and um, they are um, for presentation today. Where we're at in, in this stage of the flexible bed model, I just want to um, outline that we're currently finalising our funding stream for the model. We are finalising our service specification, which will help our care home provider partners understand um, the, um, the ask of them, um, which we will then take through to our, procure, our procurement process. And that I'm going to hand over to Beth, who's going to just explain a wee bit about engagement and the themes, and then Gary will talk you through the options. Thank you. Over to you, Beth. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks, everyone. Um, so, yeah, just to, to kind of set out, and, and I see that Rod's in the room as well, so if there's any, I'm sure Rod can, can step in as well. So, following the um, extensive work that Steph just alluded to, we the approach that we took in terms of um, this next stage through December, February was to um, undertake focused workshop sessions in each of the home team areas. Um, because of the complexity of um, what we're, we're dealing with and the amount of information that people have had, we approached people who had expressed an interest earlier in the process um, of, of engaging further and, and keeping um, involvement, of which there was about 100 and 20 people had given us their details and said they were happy to be involved. So we contacted them in the, each of their home team areas and we had uh, focused workshop, workshop sessions, mostly in the evening, but one or two were in the afternoon. Um, and that was, we limited that to about 12 um, members of the public that had, had come through from that. Now, in um, there is information within the paper pack about that we didn't actually have 12 people at every single one of those. Some of them were fully booked and people just didn't turn up at the end of the, the day for whatever reason. And there were others where we had smaller numbers of people booked on. Um, but what we found there actually there was that the depth of the conversation and the level of um, involvement for, from those people was, was actually really, really helpful. And I think probably some of the um, the most robust conversations that we had about how we move this forward. There were also staff sessions that we um, attended um, and, and set up across again through each of the, the home team areas. Um, we met with um, hospital action groups, um, as we know, around in the Galloway and uh, Newton Stewart and Kirkcupri. 
Um, and we also had uh, sessions for our elected member colleagues to provide some briefing, but also answer any questions or whatever that were needed. And those were made available to all um, elected members. Um, and similarly, general practice uh, colleagues were also in, in, uh, advised that if they wanted to have a conversation with us, we would. Um, and so there are a few in there. So that's all being collated into, as you would expect, a statement of consultation that will um, that will be produced at the end of that options appraisal process. Um, what our intention in those uh, workshop sessions and the meetings with our stakeholder groups was um, to really develop a, a conversation on the future of health and social care and support within their home team area. So they didn't focus entirely on cottage hospitals um, and we've, we've tried to give you a flavour of that across the piece, but there was a number of different um, aspects of, um, and there were, while there were some similarities between the different home team areas, um, there were actually some some um, differences too, um, but we've tried to give a, a, an, ex an overview and example of that. Um, also wanted people to have the opportunity to clarify mm -hmm. any information and really wanted to, to make sure that what we were taking from those conversations informs what our future consultation and where um, required those options appraisals that we're, we're, we're now suggesting um, go forward. So, um, some of the the key uh, aspects um, from um, the uh, engagement that wasn't directly related to the cottage hospitals was around um, things that we hear often, and we've we've heard through here about better coordination and scheduling of appointments um, that are in the uh, in DGRI or within the Galloway Community Hospital, but taking particular notice of the amount of travel time that mm. people require. Um, we also had um, a, some a, a fair amount of suggestion around how um, much people are open to and welcome the opportunity for virtual appointments or um, a, using digital uh, technology in order to, again to limit the amount of, of travel that folks are needing to do um, and um, hopefully in some other work that you'll see coming forward over the coming months you'll, you'll see um, that we're trying to respond. Uh, um, there was also suggestion that within the communities um, and, and in the cottage hospitals and within GP practices folks were recognising that there are often um, vacant rooms within there and maybe that would be something that we want to consider about how um, those could be used, whether it's for delivering health and social care and support services or other services within the um, that are operating or other community groups or whatever within that community. So there was a real um, building on that earlier conversations we've had with folk about making the real best use of the assets that are within their communities and having things close to home and and, um, and connected with their communities. There was also in some areas um, uh, some real, um, I don't know, frustration is, is too strong a word, but but really querying and, and really curious about what's happening around some of the housing with care and support developments. So I think something that we really need to, to, to be taking a bit of focus on going forward and people also recognising the um, amount of support that um, unpaid carers would, um, would, would need going forward if we're going to manage um, within the, uh, the financial and workforce challenges um, that we're, we're facing just now. So I think what was really reassuring actually was that a lot of the themes that we've had right back to the summer of Time to Talk, which was in the summer of 2022, if you remember, was about how people wanted things to be kind of joined up in their community, available to them, um, connected with families and friends and so on. So those were the, 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 the key aspects around that engagement. I think that the learning um, that we would take from that small group um, was that actually the, the depth of, of detail that we could get into in terms of working alongside our, our communities um, was really um, was, was really powerful actually. I'm not quite so sure that we've got it right still with our staff groups. We didn't get huge amount of um, 
input there in terms of people dropping into that. And I think we need to recognise how challenging that is for folks who are under a significant amount of pressure work-wise to be able to take that time out of their days. So I'm thoughtful about how we might do some of that a bit better going forward. But but those were the um, the uh, kind of headlines of that engagement through December and February, uh, till February. And I think just to um, overall, and it's highlighted in the paper, throughout the whole of this Right Care, Right Place programme, we've, we've been, we've spoken to over 1,800 um, different people and we're seeing similar themes coming through a lot of these conversations. So I think we can um, stand as a, a, an IGB and the Health and Social Care Partnership quite firmly in front of what people are, are telling us here from through that engagement. Um, and I think there's been some real benefit in these smaller conversations and also building on some of that um, independent um, analysis that we've had of, of what people have been telling us. So I, I think um, just to hand over to, to Gary directly now to take us through a little bit about what the um, the results were in terms of the options for, for each particular area and what the plan is next. But I'm going to stay around and, and talk a bit again at the end, I think. Thank you. OK, thanks, Biff. Uh, if, what I want to do next is just run through uh, what our plans are in each of the home team areas moving forward. Uh, but before we get into the detail, I want to sort of uh, identify that in each of the home team areas, there is so, some core actions that we plan to do in every home team area. So, for example, we plan to commission flexible beds in each home team area to provide short term care and support. Uh, initially, the focus will be on commissioning beds to provide palliative and end of life care or respite for carers. Uh, and we also want to begin to use those beds in due course to provide step up and step down care. So that will be common across all the home team areas. Similarly, we plan to build on the work that Viv's alluded to, that we're going to work in each home team area, continue to work with local community councils and local people to further develop and deliver preventative and early intervention approaches. Where, where there are slight differences because of the different needs of local communities, uh, is that we will be setting out proposals about the future use of community hospitals and that will differ according to home team areas uh, and I'll work through the detail uh, and I'll go through the detail for each home team area now. So if we begin first of all with Mid and Upper Annandale, uh, the proposal uh, at this stage is to retain the 14 intermediate care beds in Loch Maben Hospital. Uh, we want to build on the existing rehab services within Loch Maben and, and explore the potential for further outreach into the local community. As I mentioned earlier, we will be commissioning uh, a number of flexible beds in local care homes to provide palliative and end-of-life care and respite support for carers uh, in the home team area. For Moffat Cottage Hospital, uh, we are proposing that an options prepay appraisal be conducted to determine the future use of Moffat's uh, Cottage Hospital. Now, the options appraisal uh, will appraise a number of uh, options that we've identified based on the feedback from local communities. So for Moffat, uh, one option, and some of these options are going to be consistent with options for some of the other hospitals, but one option for Moffat is we retain the status quo i.e. the current position where there are no bed based services in, in Moffa Hospital. There are uh, some outpatient services. That's an option that, uh, that we want to appraise. A second option is to uh, what we call the status quo plus, uh, whereby there are no bed based services, but we increase a blend of virtual and inpatient outpatient services uh, at, the, at the hospital. A third option is we develop at Moffa Hospital a community health and social care hub uh, that, that will not include services, but it would involve relocating the local GP practice and primary care services to, to Moffa Hospital. And it would also include increasing uh, outpatient services within the hospital and using the hospital as a home team base. A fourth option is to uh, 
re-establish inpatient services within Moffa Hospital, and that was the position pre-COVID. A fifth option, uh, and this is based on the feedback we've received from the local community, is to consider the transfer and the ownership of the site to the local community to develop as a community hub uh, and potentially let rooms to the GP practice and the health board. And then the final option is to close the site, remove all services and sell the building. Uh, now they're, they're the options that have been identified uh, and later on they will talk through how we plan to conduct the options appraisal. If I next move on to uh, Mid and North Nisdale, uh, Again, as with all the other areas, we plan to commission uh, a number of flexible beds in local care homes to provide uh, palliative end of life care uh, and uh, respite support for carers. We also plan to conduct an options appraisal to determine the future use of Thornhill Cottage Hospital. I won't go through all the options, but the options are similar to the options I've just outlined uh, for, for Moffa Hospital. Uh, and the plan would be to establish a options appraisal group, including staff and local stakeholders, to determine which of the options be, that have been identified for Thornhill Hospital should be developed moving forward. Again, as with in each of the areas, uh, we will continue in Mid North Benetsdale to work with local community councils to further develop and deliver preventative and early intervention approaches. If I then move on to stewardry, the proposal in stewardry is to retain uh, the 16 intermediate uh, beds currently in, in Castle Douglas Hospital. Uh, we will also uh, commission uh, additional flexible care beds in local care homes to provide palliative and end of life care and respite for carers. Within the stewardry area, uh, what we're also proposing is that an options appraisal be conducted to determine the future use of Kakubri Cottage Hospital. And as with the, the options identified earlier for Moffa and for Thornhill, there'll be a similar process conducted to establish which of the options that have been identified so far uh, is the appropriate way forward. And again, in common with all the areas, we will continue to work with local community councils to further develop preventive and early intervention approaches. Moving on to Maccas, we plan in Maccas uh, again to commission flexible beds in local care homes to provide palliative and end of life care. We also uh, proposed to conduct an options appraisal to determine the future use of Newton Stewart Cottage Hospital uh, and the options that have been identified are similar to the options that have been identified in respect of Moffat and Thornhill. And we will again continue to work with local community councils to further explore how we can develop preventive and early intervention approaches. And then moving quickly on to the RINs, Within the RINs, we are proposing to retain inpatient inter intermediate care services at Galloway Community Hospital uh, and build on the established rehab services and explore the potential for wider outreach to the local community. We also plan to commission flexible beds in local care homes uh, to provide palliative and end of life care and respite support for carers. And we also plan to work with local community councils to further develop uh, preventative and early intervention approaches. And then moving quickly on to Dumfries North and South. Uh, within Dumfries North and South, we plan to retain the, the inpatient intermediate care services uh, currently in place in Mountain Hall for the next 12 months. And then and then review uh, the future use of Mountain Hall Treatment Centre to align with surge bed capacity across all hospital sites. We plan to commission flexible beds in local care homes to provide palliative and end of life care. Uh, and we also, uh, in common with the other home team areas, will continue to work with local community councils to further develop and deliver preventive early intervention approaches. And then finally, 
uh, in terms of Lower Annandale and Esdale. The proposal is to retain the 18 inpatient intermediate care services at Annan Cottage Hospital and the 12 beds at Thomas Hope Hospital uh, and explore how we can uh, the potential to uh, provide rehab services out in the wider community. We also in Lower Annandale and Esdale uh, plan to commission flexible care beds in local care homes uh, and work to continue to work with local community councils to develop preventive and early intervention approaches. That that is it. That's an overall summary of this, uh, the details that are set out in the report. I'll sort of uh, what you will see and what I would highlight is that the common themes are across all the areas. It's our intention to commission flexible beds in local care homes. Uh, it's our intention to continue that dialogue with local communities to develop more early intervention and preventative services. And the sort of key message, which I'm going to pass on to Viv now, is that we've we've set out the proposals for the future use of uh, of an, all our hospitals, but, but uh, a number of them will be subject to options appraisal to determine their longer term use. So I'll pass over to Viv just to talk through how we plan to conduct the options appraisal. Viv? Thanks, Gary. Thank you. So I think within the, the paper, it's Appendix 7 that sets out the um, uh, options appraisal guidance flowchart, really, um, which comes um, from the Healthcare Improvement Scotland um, guidance around uh, undertaking options appraisal. And I think probably worth noting, I'm sure Rod would agree, that colleagues from Healthcare in, in Improvement Scotland have been with us all the way through this programme. and. Um, uh, really making sure that we're we're managing this and taking and operating within the guidance that's there. So, again, there's quite um, a robust guidance around options appraisal, and the first stage is to um, take those options that we have there and consider those against what Scottish government um, have set out as the five critical success factors. The, the good practice guidance really says that you shouldn't really be going out to um, cons full consultation on any um, options that are not viable or able to be delivered. And those five critical success factors are around economic efficiency. Um, and, and of course, that's going to be quite a major consideration given where we are currently in, in terms of our finances, how well the object options would achieve the objectives and that effectiveness um, uh, factor, risk and uncertainty, thinking about, you know, how um, do, undertaking those sorts of assessments as well, um, distributional impacts, which is also the impact on different groups and different areas of what is a very complex system, and those social and environmental impacts as well in terms of those broader societal um, effects. And what our plan is that during this the, the this month through March, as soon as we're back from leave, um, is, is looking at um, and engaging again with the communities and stakeholders, most likely the folks that have been with us right the way through um, the process, um, um, including the folks in those community workshops to determine which of those options in each of the areas are meeting those um, uh, critical success factors. Once we have the um, shortlisted options, what uh, we'll do, and we're hoping that we'll get that, time's always very tight for these things, but through March and early April, we want to work with stakeholders, including the communities and um, staff groups, um, to uh, work through um, the scoring of non-financial benefits with their stakeholders. Finance colleagues will be helping us to undertake a financial appraisal. And from there, um, we look to, to go out with those shortlisted options to public consultation for a period of three months. Um, we can do that and get to that decision um, or, or bringing back um, the outcome of that to you in September. Um, but really, uh, in order to be able to do that, I'm, I'm keen to, to have your approval of that, uh, the 
options that we've set out there are, are acceptable to you in order that we don't have to come right back to you with this is the shortlisted option. So we want to make sure that you're comfortable that we're going to consult on what those um, what those options are and the outcome of that shortlisting process. Hope that makes sense. I'm happy to answer any questions around it. Um, what we could do through there is provide the updates to IJB throughout March and April um, and, and to yourselves back in June through the committees that are um, meeting um, during that time so that you can, so members can be kept right up to date on where we are with things. And then the outcomes of the options appraisal exercise, those um, the non-financial financial benefits and financial appraisal um, and the outcome of the consultations would be presented back to the IGB in September 2024, 2024 for that decision on the way forward. Um, so, so that's what we're planning to do, and hopefully that um, that uh, flowchart in, in Appendix Seven takes that on from there. Um, Steph, I don't know if you want to go through the recommendations, or if you want to just pause there and take any questions. Any questions anybody would like to ask? Right, I, I, well, first to put it onto the floor, are there any questions? I've got loads. Yeah, just one quick one. That is one quite often being up again. It's touched on, it's probably the point that with, I think, because we've been in a number of recent uh, meetings in regards to housing, particularly touch on extra care housing, but obviously there's wider housing needs. I'm just trying to understand what level of importance do you think, uh, whether it's extra care housing or Havon? The potential outcomes here and how will we influence the whether it's the council or strategic housing authority or the Scottish government providing funds for this how do you think that might be shaped up as we go forward we can come back to that maybe at a different time if it's if it's too off of a question for the moment <laughs> I don't know I'm, ha I'm happy to i'm happy to it's quite tricky to hear you um councillor but I think what you were asking um, was that we we'd mentioned around the um, housing with care and support and how much do we think we're influencing or are, have opportunities to influence what's happening around um, housing. And as, as you mentioned, we've been, myself and Gary and uh, David Rowland have been um, to a number of the um, workshops that the, have been being run around the housing demand and needs assessment and we've been quite vocal I think in um, in highlighting the need for housing with care and support um, and I'm comfortable with what we've seen so far that, that that's being um, that's being um, listened to and being reflected into that um, a needs assessment document. I think for us as a health and social care partnership and the IGB, the challenge is always going to be around um, identifying the support for people within those um, areas. And I think that within the with the, the support around home teams and working with our provider partners, I think ident having that kind of support around a housing option rather than it being in a, a care home or a, a hospital is, is where I think we should be moving towards um and uh, yeah i don't know if that fully answers your question but um i could add to that Viv, if it helps yeah, okay. yeah again just sort of stepping back to the right kra place report that was signed off by the ijb last september it identified that over the next sort of 10 15 years we need you know in the region of about over 200 no, 250 uh, additional community beds. Now, the definition of a community bed will include extra care facilities. So, I think later on this year there will be a plan presented to the the IJB to develop a longer term plan about how we're bridging that gap. You know that we develop you know over 200, 250 more community beds uh, over the next 10 years. And I think. Uh, the developments of housing with care and support, particularly extra care services, will be key to that. Uh, because you know what we need to do and have a debate about is what range of community beds we need to be developing. And I think it's fair to say that uh, that you know 
the early indications are that it's not just about care homes, it's not just about community hospitals, there needs to be a key role and key developments on uh, housing, care and support and extra care services. And we're hopeful in Langham and potentially Moffat, we can develop extra care services there, but we want to sort of identify and develop plans for the rollout of similar services across other parts of Dumfries and Galloway. Thanks very much, Jim. That's answered the really well. Just to, I do think it's something that will jump through the Transport, Transformation, Innovation and Futures Committee. And as you have fully worked up course, this report will come back to, to the IGB for consideration. I just I do think you've got a major role to play. So that's all I'm trying to pick up on, Thank you. And Melanie? Um, I mean, I should have been so much. Should I have to speak a little louder? So. Okay, um, there's been so much good work that's been done in, in relation to this and so much engagement for communities and it's going to be so important that we get this next stage right so I think this challenge about that are we comfortable for the long list that's basically short list without coming back to IGB is really important because what we can have coming back and you know later on is well actually why didn't you I'm, I'm not assured that of how that long list the short list happened and then we're back to where one was already consulted with our community. Thank you. So I think that, that that's a really, really important point that we are all comfortable with that because we, we really want to keep this process going and moving and moving forward and we don't want to come back in September 10 going, oh well, we're, we're not happy about how that bit happened because that 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 would be right. So just to, to just emphasize that point. Anyone else? Yeah, Mark? Yeah, so uh, like like Valerie, I, I, I agree. This is a really uh, good and positive way forward. Uh, and my only um, piece of advice would be around those five critical success factors. But uh, the, well, one is, is, is uh, the cost effectiveness. I think it needs to be about affordability and cost effectiveness as opposed to just as a cost effective model. Is it actually something that's affordable and doable uh, within the resources that uh, we have available to us? Uh, and also, I do like to see something uh, in there around the distributional impacts, not just about the impact in different groups, but the impacts of the different options. Uh, and also something that really picks up around the uh, the availability of the current workforce to deliver against the sets of options that sit there. So I think it'd be really good. Uh, to pick up something around workforce uh, as well. We're talking about those options. Yeah. It's about the, you know, that ability to deliver uh, on those options. Right. Yeah, I think very valid point, Sarah Mark. And, and you did give your things up. I don't know if you've got it on screen. I want to do that. Um, and I, I do think, yeah, it, cost effectiveness, um, it does about affordability, but clearly these are the guidelines that are given there. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't add to it and, and do, you know, have it in our consideration of deliberations. Uh, and Dave Ferguson, did you add that? Um, yeah, th this is like I went in 2020 before the pandemic. I've just woken up because this is almost where we were then. And I'm kind of what I'm saying is, can we just get a move on and get this done? Because I think every, the agreement is, other than some minor political maneuvers outside, is most people recognise this as the right way forward. It's what we should be doing. And, and I, I, I just feel as well, I've been asleep for four years and woken up and the dance happened. I think you're, so the quicker this gets out, that's pretty much I think you're reinforcing Valerie's comments. I think that's what you need to We need to make sure that we're happy and comfortable with what's coming forward so that we can actually progress it rather than having to come in to us to send it back to come back again. So if you did want to come in, then I'll let you in. Thanks, thanks, um, Chair. Yes, uh, Andy, this is a similar um, feeling from the community too. Actually, about this is this takes it. This is taking a long time, but of course, you'll be aware that the decisions that the IGB uh, can't be challenged, but the process that we followed can. So I think that the 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 sort of going out to the community, coming back in, going back out again in consultation and moving these things forward, it does take a bit of time, but that's the 
the sort of structure of the guidance around these sorts of level of decisions. So I just wanted to reiterate that it, we've, we've heard similar from some of our communities, but it, it, in order to make sure that your decisions are safe and, and can't be challenged in that way, it's about us making sure we're following that process. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, it was just that point. The Moffat the back of Wales can highlight this is absolutely right in regard to the process, but the Moffat's got a sixth option as a state school plus. So I just wonder should we just include that in the model? It might it might be the appetite for the Moffat that absolutely through the up to up to date consultation and engagement you've had with them that that's an option for them potentially. So that just in the gap process, if we couldn't be challenged, there is that potential challenge. That would be the, the community asset transfer and uh, well, state school plus is, is bulleted for number two is bill based services, increase of blind with optional and inverse and outpatient services in brackets, including primary care and increase of ambulatory care and treatments. Was it this is an extra so usage? I mean, I think well, there's a three thing or one that's getting preferential treatment there, in fact, then just a procedural thing, might even have to do nothing. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, can I ask? I mean, the, the critical success factors, there are five of those there. You know, are they weighted in any particular way, or are they all given equal weight, or are they done in hierarchical order? Do you want me to uh, just come back in, Chair? Yeah, yeah, please. Um, so that's something that we'll determine with our stakeholders in the community around that, about where, in, in terms of those, the way that the guidance from Healthcare Improvement Scotland is written is that that's up to um, the uh, the folks involved in, in the process. So we would be working with our partners uh, and our community uh, colleagues to um, to be able to determine that with, with what's there, if there's a, uh, if we need to weight things in, in different ways. And I think just given what Mark was suggesting there earlier too about, you know, using those as a basis, but potentially adding some others. And I think that that might well take us to that different um, spot for that around that. And of course, we'll also be working with our stakeholders and communities around developing the criteria for the non-financial benefit scoring as well. So there's still a bit of work for us to do to, to work through that with everybody involved in it. Okay, thank you. Um, Ian raised the issue of housing. Uh, and just last week, uh, full council, we approved funding for care and repair, BRIJB and such like. Uh, and that's not a great deal of money, but I'm wondering, you know, what options we are considering in relation to uh, adaptations at home to keep people at home, uh, you know, in order to get that care at home. Um, also, I was thinking that when Gary was going through there, he mentioned quite a number of in beds, inpatient beds for some of the cottage hospitals as well. As I'm going through the conclusions of the consultation that you've done, that doesn't really flag up very often. It does on one or two, I think, but there isn't really within the conclusions, there's a, a desire to see the hospitals being retained, but being used for different services rather than inpatient services. So I'm wondering, where the the inpatient beds where where that's generated from predominantly. Somebody got a hand up back there. That's Gary. I could come back on the care and repair, and I, I think you're right. I should maybe well. I chair the care and repair steering group that that oversees the care and repair grants. Uh, just want to flag up that it is key care and repair and other services such as handy van that we're currently commissioning. So it's our intention. Uh, to do a report, you know, within the next few months, which can run alongside Right Care, Right Place, to identify where we're currently at in terms of, you know, adapting existing properties uh, and how we're supporting people, uh, you know, through care and repair and through our minor aids and adaptions budget. So we'll go into detail now, but just to say that we will be coming back with a report, setting out the summary position at the moment where the gaps are, uh, because as people may be aware, there's huge pressure on the care and repair budget. Uh, and it's critical that we continue to, you know, to support people. Uh, so we'll be coming back with a report which can 
running alongside the, the right care, right place. It's not just about developing new services. It's about ad adapting uh, and upgrading existing accommodation as well. Uh, so I'll come back later, you know, over the next uh, few months, and that will run alongside the review of our longer term plan for right care, right place. OK, thank that's the idea. Can you address the one in relation to the inpatient beds? Because quite a number of the I started scribbling notes, so I may have missed some things. Um, then I stopped scribbling notes and started paying attention instead. But, but you did say that there was quite a number of inpatient beds. I'm wondering how we arrived at those options. So am I, am I, perhaps am I confusing things? <laughs> Yeah, sorry. The right care, right place part partial of this is um, there is um, a requirement for inpatient intermediate base uh, in the community setting at this at this point. As we move towards transformation, the case talked about doing things differently. Um, the flexible bay model gives us an opportunity to test um, something different in a bed case in the community setting. However, um, there is still a requirement at this stage, we believe, for inpatient facilities um, within a local community. So what we've got at this point in time is you've got your suspended um, hospitals, we've got facilities running in terms of these intermediate beds, but we think if we address the other parts of the, 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 the system in terms of our people that are delayed in hospital, and then our uh, inpatient facilities are up to 8% of people delayed, um, we start to address some of that alongside uh, looking at a care support at home. Um, that flow for inpatient services um, will allow us to, do, like say, to have a, a bed base within a community setting which is closer to home, but also support the whole system. So at this point, I think that um, the conclusion that has been made in terms of the information and themes is that there is a, there is a, a need at this point in time to retain inpatient services. And what we're suggesting through the options for free is that we continue to run the inpatient services. At, um, so we have got inpatient services at each of our that mean that um, and the information that's made up through the suspended hospitals, we have alternatives um, in terms of the emotional Thanks for that, Stephanie. So when you say inpatient services, is that reflection? That, would that include the flexible beds or are we talking about a, a fixed location? So an inpatient bed. Is different from a flexible bed. Okay. The inpatient bed absolutely needs supported um, through a medical medical intervention yeah. um, over a 24 7 hour period, which could not um, be provided necessarily at this point in time in a care home setting or in an extra care housing setting. So it's, there is still a need in terms of that, that, that demand um, at this point in time. So the inpatient bed is. Basically, your, your community hospital bed, which will be supported through um, medical interventions, national interventions over that 24 7 hour period because the need of that individual needs that support mm -hmm. in the facility. Julie's keeping it in, so I'll let her come in, but uh, I'm making that to you on that. So, uh, I suppose we need to the key phrases that Steph's using is at, at this point in time because I think what we do know right now is Steph's, as Steph has alluded to is that. Even with the open, the, the cottage hospitals that do have inpatient beds within them at the moment, around 60% of the people who are occupying those beds at any point in time don't require the services of an inpatient bed. They require something else, and it's because of the challenges that we have elsewhere within our system, whether that be around our care support at home model, the capacity that we have in care homes, etc. Extra care housing potentially yeah. uh, uh, contributing to the lack of availability of extra care housing as well, potentially contributing to some of that. Means mm -hmm. that we've got people occupying those beds. I think that the IGB needs to see this almost as a phased approach. This what we're being asked to do here is a stage one of a piece of work where we are really setting out what a future shape looks like um, across each of our home team areas. But you're, it's a very, very valid point, Andy, that there's been some assumptions made, I suppose, about the requirement for those inpatient facilities in each locality area. Not each home team area, but each locality area at this point in time. And I think that we might, as an IGO, want to consider as part of that option of appraisal as being really, really clear about 
the number of beds that we think in those areas where we do think in the localities there's a requirement for beds, how many of those beds they, there should be, but also potentially just to consider what might the next stage, so what, what might make that look different in the future, because if the other parts of our health and social care system where those challenges were addressed, we know that would have a huge impact in terms of the environment for those inpatient facilities. So I do think it's a really, really valid point, and I think we need to see this as phase one, but I do think within the option of phase one, Gary, you set out some of the proposals around we would retain X number of beds, I think we need to pretend within the option of phase one, consider whether that's the right assumption to be making, given everything we know about a health and social care system at the moment, but being very clear about what might that look different in the future, because what I think as an IGB we don't want to be doing is sustaining a model of inpatient facilities where 60 percent of the people in those facilities at any point in time don't require to be in them. That shouldn't be our ambition as an IGB. So I, I think that we need to consider this as a point in time, Chair, in order for us to get to that, that almost delivering that first phase of right care, right place, and then be really clear about what we need to change in the future and what does that sustainable bed base look like? What's the required bed base and what's that sustainable bed base looking like moving forward? No, thanks, Roger. I think that's, that's very, very helpful. Because I do think, it come back to what we were saying about if we continue to live on what we're doing just now, yes. it's going to cost us an yeah. increasing amount. Yeah. We're going to diminish the service we can deliver and the quality of care that we can deliver. Mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't allow us to be flexible in how we, how we go forward. So uh, that's why I was a little bit concerned, like when you said about in different people's yes. mobility, that we were going to have to have. Mm -hmm. But I think if we were to sort of accept that this is part of a, a stage, going forward, then, then I do think that that's helpful. I also wanted to flag up that um, the the Commission on the Beds, how are we how are we doing in relation to that at this point? That will be the answer. That's the procurement process. Hi, thanks, Chair. Yes, um, we're at the process where the, the specification um, is uh, just being finalised. Gary's been leading a, a team to look at that. We've got things all set up through our procurement colleagues to um, put out what, what we commission will be under the National Care Home contract. So they'll be all be within those terms. So what we do is we just, when we've got the um, finalised specification, we just go out and it only takes a couple of weeks actually for uh, partners to then come back and let us know that that's what they, that they're open to that and that they want to do that. Um, and then that uh, we just do a variation to the contract so it's quite a straightforward procurement process because we've already um, got contracts in place with our care home partners um, and uh, so we're, we're entering the final stages of that and, and should be able to um, bring them on stream fairly quickly once we've got the, the um, feedback to that uh, expressions of interest through the contract. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and yeah, thanks for what's coming, but just before I allow that, um, are we finding that you know, we've had comments that the care home situation is quite fragile. Uh, are we finding that care home owners are getting any reassurance from this approach? We've been having some pre-commissioning um, conversations with our partners. Um, certainly Gary's been involved in, in quite a, a number of those directly um, with a, a member of my team. Um, and there, there's a, there are partners who are very open to this. I think seeing that the opportunity to have um, dedicated, um, you know, kind of contracts in there, there's a lot of, um, th there's some real assurance taken from that, I think, um, because essentially we would be paying for these on a block contract, so they were available to us all the while. Um, so that supports our care home partners. Um, and I think there are other partners um, who are less inclined to um, want to participate in this. So it will absolutely be their choice. And we'll, within the next few weeks, we'll know much, much better how much they've seen that. And I think I, I think um, Steph said that this kind of proof of concept of the flexible bed within there with that wrap within care homes with the wraparound from the home teams is part of that. So I think that if we can establish some fairly quickly and demonstrate that that works, that that would then in, in, 
uh, entice perhaps some some other partners to join us. So it's a it's a little bit of an unknown just now, um, which is uh, is part of that proving the concept of it and supporting them in this way. But I'm hopeful. I'm ever hopeful that it will do, and it'll bring that um, a, a bit more of a, a sh assurance to them around their their futures. Well, you've got the bit of a hook behind you as well, and Gary, you want to come back? Yeah, no, I suppose it's just adding to Viv, really, but I think you mentioned the fragility of the care home market. I think I think actually part of the solution to, you know, reducing the fragility may be through the issuing of block contracts, which give a bit of certainty for care homes moving forward. So we'll see how the procurement goes, but certainly I'm in touch with a number of care homes, and I think they see this as partly a solution to uh, some of the financial sustainability issues they're experiencing at the moment. Uh, Thanks, Gary. Uh, and if I was, um, just, just a couple of things. It's my old hobby horses, Andy, before he's in time, but I've maintained for a long time strategic housing should be part of the IGB. Now, I know they're working well. I know they're working with uh, the IGB teams and the health social care teams and everything else. It's an informal arrangement, not a formal arrangement. Right? So, um, first, I would hope that we continue. Um, so just get that on the record. Uh, it's only based on adaptions and uh, adaptations that are actually formally in, in part of the IGB. Uh, the, the bit I was, I was going to come to here, I remember Steph and a number of others did a lot of work in Wickshire, and we learned a lot um, from that, um, which was probably one of the starters or drivers for uh, this, this whole style of, of care and um, if, if I'm picking you up right we, what seems to be the issue here is not the facility in each of the four districts or localities that meet standard it, it's the ones where we're getting the, the, all the agro from are the ones who think they should have um bed facility in particular each of the localities have a place that is up to standard with the staff um, for that, that, that care provision for somebody who requires hospitalisation for a short period of time. And I think if I remember rightly, Julie, what we said at the time was it, the college hospital is not a place you should do. You know, if you're admitted there, you should say, well, shit, that's it, I'm finished. Right? You should be able to come out. You get my drift? Yeah. Um, it, and sometimes, Andy, you just have to be blunt with stuff like this. And that's, again, the language with the, with the way explicit are put in, in, in the middle there. But sometimes we just need to hit people right between the eyes and say, you know, these facilities are many places where you go. That's, that's it. We've got a different system for that um, in terms of uh, palliative care. There's, there's a different way of looking at that. And this is. This whole system, and I remember Julie actually saying to a well-known local politician, do the maths, when she was asked about Newton Stewart and how many people, the team from the hospital at Newton Stewart were actually serving in the community, right, rather than if they'd been in the hospital. Right? And you know, we need to go back to that again and just reinforce that and, and, and get it taken forward. Um, I, I was on earlier there, so I mean, I'm really welcome the fact we're taking it further forward. Yeah, again, and it looks like yeah, again, we're we're going that extra mile, yeah, and I can understand why, right? Because this is going to be political, right? Believe me, um, but firstly, I mean, I I, I would never put my mother into you to your hospital. I would have done anything I could not for her not to go in, quite frankly. And some of the horror stories that came out of there, and I don't mean no talking about the staff, right? I'm talking about the conditions. In the condition of the building, the, all the other things, uh, it, it was horrendous. So, could we just go forward? I, I would suggest I'm totally supportive of this going forward. And we need to go forward. I, I would suggest a much quicker pace than it's currently going. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Um, I mean, there has been comment about consultation and people. Uh, I mean, I, I remember attending this very room where we had an engagement programme for part of the Right Care Right Place, sorry, uh, about the Right Care Right Place, and then having got the ideas from the communities, we then had the consultation process to make sure that 
what we are trying to sort of look at and develop would be what was actually relevant, what was it people wanted. And then we're sort of going through that and we're coming back to them and asking them how they think we could utilize cotton trust holes, what would they think they found the care approaches and such like. And and I'm getting some feedback that when you go to start consulting and when you go to start doing, and I, and I think we're actually moving towards that. Come September, I'm hoping that we're going to the position to actually say, right, sign this end off and move forward. But again, I think it goes back to the the information, the communications that we've got and getting that information out there so people understand what that is. And I think, you know, Andy said it's not political. I think it is political because we need to get the information out as to what we're doing, why we're doing it, when we're doing it and how we're going to get there. And I do think that, you know, there are politicians out there who are pushing for Scottish hospitals to reopen. And they may well reopen, but perhaps never in the guise they were in. But, you know, that will be the outcome of what this, this piece of work will be. And I think that we need to educate our politicians to get them to understand what the pressures are and how we can deliver that quality service in the community as close to home as possible. Well, just um, taking us back to that that process of going from a long list of options to a short list of options and how obviously critical that is. Um, uh, it'd be good to understand whether that the, the process of using the critical success factors to help score or narrow that, that that list the different list different localities whether that also result in a preferred option that will be part of that next stage of consultation and do i comment on that yeah Beth. thank thanks chair thanks willem so yeah essentially the going from the um long list that we've got to the short list should take us to um it may be that we come to a preferred option but it might be that we get to where there are a, a two or three different options that we go out to full consultation on so that's why that that critical part because you don't want to go out with something that you're not going to be able to deliver um as I say, which is why that kind of key stage around those five critical factors and potentially the additional um ones that mark has mentioned um it, it is such a crucial part and why it's important that we do that with our stakeholder um uh, and and uh, community partners but yes yeah, we actually call it final consultation not full i know we're about many right yeah but because if we're going to make a decision in September, yeah, fully final consultation, fully final, yeah. yeah. Okay. This is thanks for taking time out your late evening to come and join us today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's no one else. I'll go to the recommendations. Okay. We're asked to note the feedback from the engagement activities uh, for the home teams between December and February. Note the need to reach more diverse cross section of community during the next stage of consultation. Approve the proposed options for options available for each of the four cottage hospitals with currently suspended inpatient services. Approve the outline options appraisal process and timeline. Approve that the Community Health and Social Care Directorate continue to work closely with the home team area communities to build on the good conversations that have taken place to explore possible areas for development and implementation. Um, that's it. Yeah. Any comments? Any, is everyone OK with that? Can we go forward with that? Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you once again. OK, folks, welcome back. Hope you all enjoyed your lunch. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> Not got a great deal more to go through, but if we can, we'll take the last couple of items out of order and we'll take item 10, which is the Chief Social Work Officer's annual report 22 and 23. Uh, we've got Stephen here. I don't know if he's expected that or not, but um, it's on his toes. Uh, Stephen, over to you. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, well, I wasn't expecting it to be picked up prepared for this morning. <laughs> but, uh, this paper is self-explanatory, but I just want to give you a little bit of context as to what it is. Um, so every chief social work officer in Scotland has to write a report using a term, but it's the template's not great, but it's it's the and we have to report certain things back to the office of the chief social work officer so that Scottish ministers can have a look, scrutinise, etc. It's one of those reports that's unique, yeah. fairly unique in, in terms of the report belongs to the Chief Social Work Officer doesn't belong to the council, who employs the Chief Social Work Officer. 
So the idea of these stories is there for free of information only. Um, it's one of those things that it's absolutely at the Chief Support Officer's gift. I was presented. This one's a little bit unusual because this was actually the criminals report. So it would be absolutely remiss of me not to mention that to, to folk in the room. This seemed like a long time since Lillian retired. And if anybody follows her on social media, we will see the wonderful things that she's doing in life. I know that's not quite appropriate for the meeting, but I'll throw it in that anyway, Chair. Um, but serious matters. What, what the report does show for the year 22 23 is the, the considerable increase in work for, for the delegated services that predominantly Steph is responsible for it, and just him as well, um, on the health and social care partnership, but also the non delegated services in relation to children's social work, but also just as social work. Our staff across the piece um, uh, you know, did a remarkable job throughout the pandemic. This was the first year that was properly post pandemic and we were seeing the significant and chronic impacts on the most vulnerable members of our society. And many of them come through and across all of our doors, but, but through you know, the social work services. It wasn't just the increase in the numbers that we've seen, but decrease in staff because of retirees, people who are just worn out, and people who have gone to do other things. But we also see a significant increase in complexity of social need that came across the door. And I think that would be, you know, well seen by people who are you know, responsible for operations in, in this room and others. So um, in summary, what I would like to do, um, and I've done this already, is, is really congratulate the staff at the front line and, and their best line managers for the tremendous work that they do um, and you know, find ways as we move forward. And, and I think this next point like, chimes with what we discussed today is find ways to deliver all of our, so not just social work, but all of our services differently so we can get the most impact for vulnerable people. And that will take a seismic change in the way we think and the way we do. So I've gone a little bit kind of off piece, but I just thought as Chief Social Work Officer, I'd get that into the into the agenda today. So I'm, I'm happy to take any questions, comments or queries that's in the report, bearing in mind it's almost two years old now. And, and an apology to this committee, but I got I got the ordering wrong. I, I asked for it to come to a meeting of the IJB, not the IJB. I'll get that right next time. So I'll have to take any comments or questions. For yourself, Chair. Over to the floor. Well, rather than reflect on this historical new young goals, and then you stand until you went to the to CSWO to the CSWO director, you head for very shortly. What do you see as being your biggest challenges over the next year? <laughs> can I just say that, and I'll be fair to Councillor Carruthers right now as the chair of an interview panel not that long ago, he asked me that exact question, um, so I won't give the same response. I think it's challenge this year. Work, if I used one word, I would say workforce. We've got a workforce that, if I'm being honest, is on its knees, and again, I'm sure many people in this room can, can refer that. We didn't stop throughout the pandemic. You know, like many parts of society stopped. None of our services around these tables stopped. But if they did, they did something significantly different. So our staff are exhausted, our staff are leaving, and our staff are seeing people living in poverty. And it's absolutely chronic to see that, to live that and get that vicarious trauma yourself. So supporting the staff in the best way that we can, changing the way that they deliver services so they feel as though they're making a difference and they feel valued and it's easy to tell people you value but the feel value is very different so for me the biggest challenge with this next year is ensuring a proving engagement with those staff but showing them that together we can make changes to their lives and important the lives of the people that we're working with um if you're going to ask me how we're going to achieve that we'll take off paper because i think a couple of hours <laughs> i was going to ask you i wanted to ask you the how you how would you describe telling please be well <laughs> you the feel the way you're committing that, that that's exactly the way it's going to But just say thanks to Lily in, in particular as well. Yeah. She's had a deliver of this. Uh, you're here representing that at that particular point in time. So thank you, Chair. You're welcome. Anyone else? Well, you did that as soon as I looked away, didn't you? <laughs> Well, it's, it's been really interesting for you've seen them like the case studies as well. You know, getting them home, seeing you know how, how challenging you know these roles are for individuals, and I think you, you summarise that as well. And, and and I think that 
the, the issue that you've made about how you support the most vulnerable children and kind of really trying to make the impact of the cost of living um, has, has had. I can't imagine it's been easy to do that in the past few years. Um, but how do you see the future of that being able to do that? And I think how we all work together to support people to get that financial, because there is a lot of financial support available out there, and how our you know, teams and things get people signposted and supported that because actually that makes such a big difference for how people can you know, um, live healthier and more enabled lives and, and actually kind of mitigate some of these impacts. So I just think it's really important for you to If I met you, there's a, there's a case study that we didn't put in the report and it's well by the family support work and support the family who are living in poverty and this member of staff did a job and they first worked the extra mile and we've got like income maximisation, maximising the benefits, how to prepare for meals, just organise the life. So this family saved up £50 and bought a, a gift voucher for a member of staff and gave it a thank you card. And must admit, when I heard that in a team meeting, it brought me to tears in terms of the impact that that person had, the, the relationship they built, the value that was there. These people, six months earlier, couldn't afford to do anything, but they managed to save money and present that now clearly the member staff couldn't accept that but you know we found a way that you know the family could mark that and that went back but that strength of that for me in terms of the case example was was phenomenal and it did bring me to tears and i'm quite a tough little guy at times you know i'm really a big softy but the power of, of the lived experience and the voice and reports like this we cannot lose you know and um just thought i would mention that one yeah i think that's a really important point Stephen. i think all the, the professional advisors here will supervise staff who do make a difference to people's lives. Uh, and we always hope that it's, it's for the better, but there'll be plenty of examples like that. Yeah. And I think it was really incumbent upon us to try and promote that message and to get that out there. But for every complaint we have, and, and to be honest, we don't get that many, you know, compared to the sort of the delivery of service that we provide. But I think for every complaint we've got, we have got examples like that, and we don't get them out there. And I was, I was speaking to Julie earlier about someone I spoke to yesterday who has been diagnosed, has a cancer diagnosis, and they said that the service that they've had, the care that they've had, and, and they've not been operated on yet, and they're saying everything's so spot on, everything's going forward, and we really need to try and get that message out there because there are so many people who are doomsayers who put out the, oh, the NHS is broke, it's not working, this and that. You know what, well, it's a big organisation, we go for short at times, but there are times when we're going to deliver and it's the same for the local authority. You know, people go about bad mouth in the council. I mean, we were talking earlier about things don't, you know, people don't want things to change. I said, so you know, children back to cart and horses. Do you know what, they had potholes back then as well. Otherwise, how did the wagon wheels come off? You know, it, it's not a new problem. You know, whose fault was it then? But we need to sort of get that message out there that we're doing a good job and job our staff should be proud of. I've asked all of my staff and all of the different teams to come forward with those examples of good practice and when we get thanks and, and the staff just don't do it because they see it as their job. We've got this thing in sort of what we call a significant occurrence form and the first bit in bold on that form says examples of good practice and bank things. The only time I get a significant occurrence of form is if somebody's died and they've nearly died. <coughs> There's a mindset that we've got to get beyond and I think we've all got to take ownership of that and and if I may, I had to attend the emergency department with my daughter a few weeks ago, and the staff were absolutely phenomenal. So every man and woman in there, regardless of what the job was, and I, and I took my time to, to thank them on behalf of my daughter, but she wasn't quite able to because it was broken. And, and I said to the, the consultant, I said, Do you have a form? He said, I really don't know. So I emailed Jeff. I'm not sure if I could copy you and Julie, but I emailed Jeff to ask if that could be reported. So we've all got it upon ourselves as well to make sure that we acknowledge that work, whether that's as a citizen or as a or as an employer as well. And couldn't agree more that we've got to do much, much more of that. So every time I present a few social opposite report, I will take as long as I can to make sure that we mention our staff and the thanks that we get, whether that's social workers, whether that's medical staff, we need to do more of it. So thank you for entertaining you. Let me speak yeah. a little bit more on that. Well, I'm going to ask you a difficult one, but I think I might a difficult question. And recently, the report on carers and foster mm -hmm. um, didn't show us in a good light. So, you know, Ian asked you what was your biggest challenge over the year. Where, where does that figure in your challenges? 
to be honest. I've always strongly welcomed regulation and inspection because it tells me on the whole where you are and where you need to be. Um, the fostering and adoption inspection reports were not anywhere near the level um, of quality that I would like. But what I would say is the, the method of inspection is not proportionate. And I've had this conversation with the care inspector. I'm also having them with the Office of Chief Social Work Officer. So they look at a small number of cases and they look at a small number of measures. And in those small number of cases and the small number of measures they looked at, we did fall short in some areas. However, what I can assure this board and why I will add evidence to the care inspector as we move forward is the quality of care that our children receive is very, very good and better in most cases. There will always be times when things fall short. But what I will share is the complexity and the demands that are out there. One of the reasons that inspection report was, was poor. You see, in no disease the context in the back story, so I was to give you that opportunity to put that out there. Well, one more for me is currently we've got probably one of maybe two where the NHS have put all their services into the NJV, and yet we, the local authority, have not put children's social work services in. Is that something that we, we were just done a review of the NJV, so it's not happening tomorrow? But is that something that you think might happen in the future? Or? Would be worthwhile? It's a big question. Um, very big question. Mm -hmm. I think structures are structures. Um, for me, what's important is behaviour and relationships and how we deliver. Um, the, the National Press Service Bill went through the press stage last week. Um, it was unchanged from the bill that was quite controversial for many people. Um, a bit of a gateway of legislation, if you like. So the Scottish Government. NHS Scotland, COSLA, etc. are all now having to work out what that means, and it may well be able to be mandated. It is the Scottish Government's preference that children's services, just as services, are included within the National Care Service, but the research that they commissioned and the position of COSLA strongly opposes that. Um, so whatever we do nationally, or sorry, whatever happens nationally, we will have to follow if we're mandated to do so. Um, as we move forward, we've got to consider What's best for Dumfries recent Galway? What's best for our citizens? And if it is best that children's services are included, then, then, then so be it. I think there is a danger, though, that the really important connections that children's social work has with schools and education and with community services, um, which will still be part of the council, you would lose something there. And perhaps you would lose something that's more significant to children themselves in relation to that education elements and what happens in their society as opposed to what happens in their health care. So um, I would never close my mind to anything. Um, so will it happen at some point in the future? It probably will because most things happen in the future, don't they? I'm going on full circle, but I don't know what I don't know when the future would be and whether I'll still be working on that Andy. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you don't ask me anything else. That come no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Nobody else need to get what's your first name? <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. So, recommendation is to build forms to the social work services uh, in respect to key duties and responsibilities for which the CSWO has overall responsibility. So, thank you for bringing that forward, Stephen. Uh, we'll go step back one now to item nine complex needs service evaluation framework. Another nasty, short, concise time. Uh, we've got Justin Murray, I believe. Yeah, uh, Justin Murray's online with us. Uh, this paper offers an update to the IGB, to the IGB sorry, in relation to complex needs service and development of value framework for the service. Uh, that's all I've got here, Justin. So it's over to you, really. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, all. Thanks for inviting me along today. Um, so just I'll all assume you've had a chance to read the paper submitted, and I've been asked to give a brief update with regards to the complex needs service evaluation framework. So. We back context. So in May 2023, responsibility for complex care LD was transferred to the mental health directorate, and we had a complex needs plan developed by the management team and approved by a good sales IGB in September 2023. To support the implementation of the complex needs plan, an evaluation framework has been developed and agreed. So the aim of the framework is to achieve the delivery of the complex needs plan, evaluate activity and models of care, and evaluate against projected budget savings. So our key areas of focus are delayed hospital discharge, namely in Mid Park, out of region transfers and repatriation back to the region, 
and hopefully reduce the need for out of region placements in the first place and reduce agency spend with our care packages. So in terms of progress, implementation plan, we've agreed that and that's been signed off with KPIs within the uh, performance framework. The port line is agreed with the mental health management team making, so the report line is every quarter and saving plans have been agreed and the first year savings look like being approximately about a million pounds. So that's a kind of good news story, but there are some risks attached to this. So the main risks would be around staffing vacancies and potential skill gaps, in particular in the ambition to have an outreach team, which would prevent any undue hospital admissions. So that's been quite difficult. A lack of available supported accommodation, which you know speaks for itself, is like we, we don't have that. Then we've got a lot of issues with sort of flow and discharge options. And really one thing that we're uncovering is unknown transitions which are already in the system which we didn't know about in May 2023. So we do have a lot more intelligence around that and we've got an aim and an ambition to have a, a really good intelligence pathway for transitions from children's services into adult services. And probably highlighting that we've got a really uh, good management team structure around that, namely Sharon Young, Kay Forrest and Glenn Graham from Commissioning. It's a really good uh, example of teamwork and, and around a complex issue. But one of the things I have to raise in terms of this is that I'll, I, those guys are potentially looking to, well, certainly Sharon Young is looking to retire in the next year. She was potentially retiring this year, but she's just going to be going next year. And again, that'll be a big loss to the, the ambitions of the team. So that's a kind of snapshot of the paper. I'm assuming that's what you were looking for. And I'm happy to take any queries or any questions uh, from my esteemed colleagues. On the floor. Yeah. Andy. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if it's the right forum, but <clears throat> what's the length of the wait list for children awaiting diagnosis? Uh, Andy, I wouldn't know that because the children don't fall under our responsibility. Mm. It's for the new developmental assessment service that we can type at the moment. I don't know, it's been months. Oh, yeah. Our work towards the 18 weeks, but uh, we're probably got a plan of six months till we get there. Um, there's a lot of work going on about redesigning the pathway, Andy, about putting in triage, making sure we're signposting people at the most appropriate um, teams. Yeah. And at the moment, it can be up to a year. Um, but we are working and it has reduced um, over the last, since January we've been putting new bits in, in place. So there's a six month plan here in the 18 weeks. Yeah, because obviously once that diagnosis takes place, there's mm -hmm. mostly the formal yeah. assessment to the social work team, they've done the medical diagnosis. Um, that gives that young person or child or adult rights. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, and I, I think we'll part of work with all the disciplinary team are doing the one day is making yeah. it that they, there is not the required, the same requirement for the diagnosis per se for people to get access to the support that children and their families to get access to the support that they require. And I know that's part of the work that they've been, the multidisciplinary team, including education, health and social work, have been working together to identify because that is a risk. If people see the diagnosis as the only point at which you can get access to that support and that help that you require, then that's that's obviously a really challenging place for families to then work with, you know, meeting times that we've got. But I mean, certainly the last figure I had was sort of over 900 children on the waiting list, so it's a huge number of people. So I think that the, the team are looking at what can they do, what signposted, what support can be offered to children and their families whilst they are going through that pathway of that that assessment and diagnosis. But I don't know if Stephen, yeah. I think Stephen maybe wants to come in. Yeah, thanks, Julie. <laughs> yeah. Andy, the can answer the diagnosis work time question with us. It's not my area, but the point that Julie's made is really, really important is that from a children and family social work perspective, if somebody approaches us for an assessment, they don't have to have a diagnosis. We look at what are the presenting issues and the, what outcomes does a, a child and family need. And um, we, we very rarely look at those in that respect. Um, I think there has been some confusion, though, in, in some parts of the region in terms of the access and support in schools. And I think there's been some miscommunication, but it's been righted whereby some people have been told, like, need the diagnosis before you can get the support. But that's not the case. And that's been 
really emphasised <coughs> through the director of education and SF that you know the support should be there. Excuse me. What I would like to add though is in terms of university, it's one of the key aspects of the children's services plan which belongs to the whole of the region. And we've got um, Mary Smeddle and um, Linda Bigger jointly leading the working group there. And they did an excellent presentation to um, Book Council and Youth Council and one of the, the breakaway groups showing how they're working together, how they're trying to assist colleagues in getting those working times in terms of diagnosing them, but what's important and how to get access to information. So uh, websites have been updated, the information is there for families, good we're getting better signposts for people in the right place so the supports can be in place. So it's absolutely a priority of the wider planning partnership. Um, so I hope I can give you some assurance, not necessarily in terms of that, that diagnosis, but if, if I may as well as you'd also referenced the importance of the diagnosis for adults and some of the things that that kind of enables them to do. Some of the people in the room will be aware we used to do what's called a future needs assessment, which did give that label formally. That stopped, but we still do that through the, the planning process in, in relation to children's planning. So we still need to look at how we do that before a child becomes an adult. But we start that planning a minimum of two years before they leave school now, and we're, we're going to formalise those processes of the planning process you're getting right for every child. So hopefully that might go somewhere to give you an assurance. Yeah, if I can come back in on it, yeah, because the, 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 the people who've got certain conditions, the, the, the parents or loved ones or whatever, they, they say they can have some probably either formal or informal support group. Mm -hmm. And that's where the communication is because all you need is uh, Mrs. A to Mrs. B, or I would think, what have you took a year and a half, right? And all of a sudden, so again, communication comes into this. We need to be absolutely really, really clear in um, uh, what, what, what we're offering. Um, so, I, I, the, so thanks for the, the, the reassurance, but um, just there's still time, there's maybe a, a bit more work we can do here uh, uh, just, uh, just to nail it down so that we can actually. You have that very positive conversation with people rather than the very negative often you see from the uh, public facing platforms. Thanks, Andy. Well, it, in, in the report um, 7.4, it refers to uh, the Community Living Change Fund and a grant that uh, is being that there's a risk of it being. Uh, be called by the Scottish Government if it's not spent by the date of March. I just wonder whether there's any update on that. Yeah, yeah, we've had an update. It's fairly encouraging, but I don't want to jinx it. So it looks like they are going to retain that and we will get that funding, which is pretty critical to get moving on that new build. So yeah, it looks fairly positive, but fingers crossed. Yeah, we have had confirmation that we are able to retain that beyond the 31st of March. Um, we did, um, through myself and David Grohl, and we did put a strong representation of such government around the impact of withdrawing that, that funding. So I think we're in a positive place, I'm quite more positive than Justin, so that's good. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, excellent. Um, Justin, one of the things you said was about how effective the team is, uh, and the fact that you've got someone who's due to retire but hasn't, but they're going to go next year. So what do you have by way of succession planning to make sure you've got somebody who's going to come in and be up to speed on time to maintain service? Sure. Uh, so in terms of succession planning, we've got two internal people who are interested in the post. So they're doing a bit of active shadowing, etc., to learn more about the job. But I just spoke to Sharon this morning and we're going to look at a sort of remodel and give us a couple of options appraisals for next year because let's be honest, we're in a financial picture that's looking to reduce some costs. So there may be an option there to reduce some of the costs in here and we need to give that up as an option uh, going forward. So we're planning to have something on the table by June, July this year, but uh, certainly in terms of the succession plan, we've got a couple of internal candidates who are keen and actively pursuing that. Excellent. The, the, the challenge that you have with somebody like Sharon going as the local knowledge and experience it goes, um, I have to say that Kay as well, who's worked alongside Sharon, has been pivotal. That social worker coming in with that expertise and working alongside health really shows you how integration can be really effective in pooling resources and commissioning have been great as well. Thank you for that, Justin. 
No. Okay, thanks. Uh, we'll, we'll let you go and go on the rest of your day. Thank you for that. Okay, um, next item on the agenda is any other business deemed urgent by the chair due to a need for a decision. Um, this is Julie's last meeting. Uh, after this, she, she moves on to Pastor's new, but not so far away. But but this is Julie's last gig as the uh, the lead officer. Now I've only known Julie for a, a fairly short period of time. I've been very impressed with what she does. She's a good handle on briefings, very knowledgeable, able to deal with conflict and confrontation, very supportive. Uh, and I've got nothing but thanks and praise for her for, for the role and the support that she's given to me. Uh, I know from others around the room that many of you feel the same. So I think it would be really just if we all just give her a big round of applause and say thank you very much. Say what the interim arrangements are going to be. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start crying actually. So it feels it feels really strange just the, the very thought that this is my last IGB meeting. You know, it's been having been here right from the beginning, from the outset of the IGB. It's you know, we've certainly been through lots and I have to say I just feel so positive and encouraged and optimistic about the future and the role of the IGB as it moves forward. I think even particularly given the conversations and the discussions we've had today. So key to that obviously will be the appointment of a new um chief officer for the IGB. Um what the proposal at the moment is, is that we are working through a process, an internal process, to appoint an interim chief officer. Um, we are officers um, from both the local authority and health who, have, who are operating at that, that kind of deputy um, level. Um, we have offered the opportunity to submit an expression of interest to take on the role on an interim basis for a period of six months initially in order that we can bring a paper to the IGB and April to set out the recruitment process because, as you'll all know, the person is accountable to the, the chair of the IGB for the development of the strategic commissioning plan, but also to the two chief executives of the health board and the local authority for that um, chief officer role within the health and social care partnership. So we want to develop a really inclusive recruitment process for that permanent role. Um, and 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 the proposal would be that we would bring we would bring something to the IGB in April because you as IGB members need to have real ownership of that appointment to that that kind of that role. So we'll work through a process in March to appoint an interim chief officer. But the proposal would be that the the candidates would be interviewed by myself as the incoming chief executive of the NHS and John Roberts as the chief executive of the council. But that then there would be a a virtual meeting of the voting members of the IGB called in order that we can present the output from that interview process to the voting members of the IGB to make sure you're comfortable with that as an interim arrangement. And we'll then bring a paper in April to set out the proposal in terms of the recruitment to the permanent um, the permanent position um, in order that we can get that. Obviously, it's been a fairly time-limited period um, since I was appointed to the Chief Exec role for me taking up my post as Chief Exec um, of NHS DMG um, and these recruitment processes obviously take a wee bit um, of time and a wee bit longer, I suppose, when you're also involved in both health board and local authority and that's it's a bit more complex than even our usual routine um, recruitment processes are. So um, you'll, you'll definitely get a paper in April. Feels weird that I wouldn't be here to present that paper to you in terms of what that process will be, but you'll get that paper in April, April setting out the, the proposal. So, Would you want to present that even though you achieved that? Because there'd be nobody. I think it's the chief of Pam as the director of HR, like who's leading, um, Pam's leading on the, the recruitment. What will happen is myself and Dawn will meet with the voting members once we've had the interview process for the interim arrangement to just set out to you that process and the outcome from that to make sure you've got confidence in that as a process. Um, I've spoken to Andy obviously about that in advance in terms of what the proposal was. Um, but as I say, we'll then bring in Pamela, will then bring forward the paper that sets out the, the recruitment process for the permanent appointment. And, and I suppose I would just want to just put on record my huge thanks to everybody who's been involved in IGB over the last eight years. I have worked with five different chairs of the IJB, all of them very different um, 
and I hope they've got two of them in the room um, today. So it's lovely that Anne is also here as well from my last um, IGB meeting. But um, it's been a real privilege, actually, as, as you know, lots of people, senior people in the public sector, get the opportunity to work with existing organisations and have the opportunity to create a new one in terms of a new or new um, organisation through the IGB. So I feel really privileged to have been part of that for the last eight years. And I would just want to thank you all and really look forward to continuing to work with you all in my role as Chief Exec of the NHS Board. And whilst I won't be around this table um, formally, I'm sure I'll still have the relationships with everybody in the room in terms of how we continue to work together in my new role. So thanks very much and thanks, Andy, for your kind thoughts. Thank you. Any questions on that process? <laughs> yeah. Is, no, thanks very much for your kind of I'll just take a Andy, see if we're not too much because I'm probably speaking to you personally and answer that. Mm -hmm. But see, so interim arrangements to the scheme of delegation, so it's speaking yes. to consultation with the board members. Yes. The, the more permanent, so when the, the appointment of the new chief chief oh. officer comes up, will that be the board here that makes yes. sense? Right. Yes. It'll be the voting members of the board, but there will be a proposal that comes. But ultimately, if there was a vote on that, it would be then the voting members. But what I would be, what I would probably suggest to you is, is that members are, if all the members around this table should be involved in the process of the appointment. So council and NHS do these things quite differently in terms of their recruitment processes. Um, there's some similarities, but there's some quite significant differences. And I think um, Andy obviously has been involved in, in both um, of those recruitment processes of late with obviously the Chief Executive of the NHS, the Director of Nursing and obviously the Chief Social Work Officer being appointed. So we need to is about looking at what's the best of each of those and creating a process that the IGB is comfortable with. And I think um, making sure that members of the IGB voting and non-voting members and advisory members are obviously part of that process of recruiting the chief officer um, into the new role um, on a permanent basis. But it was felt that given the need for us to bring someone in from the 1st of April because of me taking up my new role, that we would do a kind of short and abridged version of that for the interim role and then do the full process for the permanent role. Thank you. When are we likely to be notified of that decision? It will definitely be, well, it has to be obviously be by the end of March. Um, I think Pamela's still really trying to work to get a date in the diary for the interview. She's gone out and done the expressions of interest, had the expressions of interest back. So we just need to get that that interview date in. But I think she was looking at the middle of March for that, Amber, if I'm right. Is that right? Right, but it's 15th, 14th, 15th of March, I think. Um, if we can get that, or it will be the following week of the latest answer. But I think it was trying to get the end. What we were hoping to do was do the interview and, and, and then have a virtual meeting with the voting members almost immediately after it, just to feed back and just to give you um, so that we could then get a nice and successful candidate. It's in the 9th and 20th. The 20th, yeah. Okay. Andy? Um, just a couple of things. The voting members, does that include the substitute member? Or just the no, voting member? Unless they're subs. Yeah. You subs will become. Yeah. 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 Well, when you're substitute, you're the member. Yes. Yeah, yeah but well, there'll be a formal committee when you're actually speaking yeah. to yeah. the. But you're coming for the next six months, so you get invited, my brother. Right, okay. Yeah, so the actual, I suppose the, the people that we would call would be the voting members, but if you're a substitute for one of those voting members, you would come into that call. But what we wouldn't do would be, because there's five substitute members in the council, only one substitute member in the NHS, so it would be the 10 voting members that would be asked to endorse the appointment of the interim, and all members will be involved in the appointment of the permanent. Okay, can, can I just say uh, one last thing? Uh, Julia, I, I've been involved in this for years since before it was the IGB. That's right. I'm saying it started to go. Um, the biggest fear through all that time, and the biggest compliment I, I can give you, other than the local compliment, is when I was at the chair's meetings up in Edinburgh, and Andy will be part of now, um, the fear was somebody was going to steal you. And that's, how you that's where you were discussed at the chair's meeting um, about you and one other, um, as the, so the two drivers the whole thing for the, for the rest of Scotland. And they were coming here to see how we did it. Yeah, um, which was fantastic for us. Um, yeah, I, I really, I, I mean, I just kind of think, I mean, we also gave you Julie's roadmap. Yeah, I sure. um, <laughs> I, I've still got it, Andy. You've still got it. I've still got it. 
Um, and you just have to get a new room up for the, the NHS. Okay. I'm sure somebody will get you a t-shirt for that. You know? <laughs> so, but uh, thank you very much for everything you've done. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Andy. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that. Finished that a little bit. Yeah. Um, <laughs>